Thank you uh, so much for letting me speak. Um, I know a lot of you um, deal with us referring you patients uh, dealing with uveitis. Um, uveitis is really kind of a passion of mine, and um, a lot of these patients are underserved. We really rely on uh, management with rheumatologists to help treat these patients. Uh, these are my disclosures that I have. Um, I also have to disclose I made some spelling mistakes, which I think I fixed, so sorry about that. Um, now, what are some key takeaways? The key takeaways are kind of understanding the importance of HLA-B27 iritis. Uh, interpret the role, um, why we need your help uh, when we refer patients with uveitis to you. And also try to develop approach. Like you probably know, you get asked, you know, help us treat these patients. So um, let's talk about that. So when you talk about uveitis, uveitis is our big global term. Uh, what we try to do is break it up into anatomic locations. And at least for me, when I trained, that's kind of the best way to limit the differential diagnosis. So if it's in the front of the eye, we call it an anterior uveitis, the middle part of the eye, intermediate uveitis, and the back of the eye, a posterior uveitis. It can encompass all areas of what we call a pan-uveitis. So when you get that referral, what you're really looking for is what that uh, person sent to you is this is iritis, intermediate uveitis, or posterior uveitis. Because again, the differential starts to uh, shrink down. Now for treatment, um, we think about the phases. So if it's acute, recurrent, and chronic, kind of determines our treatment. Also, etiology. Remember, all inflammation in the eye isn't uh, autoimmune. Uh, we can get infectious causes and masquerades, including uh, cancer. So we don't want to miss uh, those causes. Now, when you look at all uveitis, um, most uveitis is non-infectious, 91%. Definitely don't uh, forget about the infectious etiologies, but most of the time it is uh, non-infectious. When you look at all uveitis non-infectious, majority of them are in the front of the eye, iritis. Um, because of what I do, most of my colleagues uh, take care of the bread and butter iritis, and this is what they deal with day in and day out. Uh, I deal with more of the posterior segment disease, which tends to be uh, more severe, but again, it's much more rare. If you look at intermediate uveitis, maybe 1% of this group, uh, non-infectious posterior uveitis, 8%, and pan-uveitis, 9%. So again, that is a very, very small group of patients that we are dealing with. But the bread and butter is anterior uveitis that we see in the front of the eye. Now, when you talk about um, iritis, or uh, anterior uveitis, uh, another way I like to break it down is by age. So like you probably know, if uh, there are some pediatric rheumatologists, um, anterior uveitis has a slight different differential in kids versus adults. Uh, so we think uh, the biggest one is juvenile uh, idiopathic arthritis. Uh, HLA-B27 can be there, sarcoidosis, and infectious etiologies. But in adults, uh, we just tend to think of HLA-B27 herpetic eye disease, idiopathic sarcoid syphilis, maybe TB. That's one of the developing ones. Uh, the eye might be a privileged space where you don't get it in lungs, but you get it in the eyes. But if you look at this list, you can see the list of causes of iritis is actually pretty short. You saw I didn't throw in lupus. I don't get an ANA. Like, it drives you nuts when you get a referral for someone who's ANA positive. It drives me nuts when I'm giving lectures to residents all the time. So. Uh, the list is pretty strong, small. Well, what about HLA-B27? If you look at all causes of iritis, inflammation in the front of the eye, HLA-B27 comprises 50% of those causes. So I tell the residents, if I'm giving you a pimp question in the, in the clinic and you have to take a guess and you like going to Vegas and gamble, you get a 50-50 chance that I'm asking you about HLA-B27. So out of that group of anterior uveitis, which is a large group, half of those are HLA-B27 positive. Uh, this is pretty redundant for you guys, but like you know, uh, HLA-B27 encodes for 3 one alleles. Uh, there's some subtypes where are more commonly found in North uh, Europeans. And at least for the eye disease, the subtypes 05 and 02 are associated with anterior uveitis. Now, when you look at HLA-B27, uh, other non-HLA-B27 uh, genes can be uh, predisposed to having anterior uveitis. So if you look at some first-degree relatives, and we see this quite a bit, who have um, a relative who's B27 positive with anterior uveitis, they're at a 13% chance, greater chance of having anterior uveitis 
than non-affected non HLA-B27 patients. Now, if you look at genomic scans, family members with uh, multiple HLA-B27 are more likely to have anterior uveitis. There's also other chromosomes that can be involved. So uh, 3, 5, 9, especially 9 with linkages on 21 and 24 are more commonly associated with anterior uveitis. So HLA-B27 is uh, super important uh, for us. Like you also know, it's, uh, we know about the bacterial triggers, uh, which we see, Sama, Shigera, Yersinia, Campylobacter, H. pylori, and Chlamydia. Um, when you look at animal models, and unfortunately in my fellowship days, I had to make uh, Frankenstein rats with uh, uh, knockout bone marrows, and we marked uh, the chromosome to look at the uh, uh, um, uh, inflammatory cells traverse the uh, blood eye barrier. But when you look at these uh, cells, um, we know that uh, HLA-B27 can present and trigger the CD8 response, and the antigens are actually similar in self-antigens that are found in the eye. So this is, again, why we see it and why we have these animal models that we can trigger autoimmune uveitis. Now, toll-like receptors can also play a role. So uh, like you know, toll-like like receptors play a role in bacterial infections and may uh, play a role in autoimmune uveitis. Uh, Toll-like receptor 4 um, has been shown expressed in the iris and ciliary body, so front of the eye. Um, if you guys don't know anatomy, the iris is the color part of the eye, and the ciliary body is right behind it that makes uh, the uh, fluid production in the eye. So that gives us our eye pressure. Um, lipoprotein saccharide, that's actually one of the uh, molecules we use to induce um, uh, experimental uh, autoimmune uh, uveitis, uh, has a high sensitive sensitivity to this toll-like receptor 4, and uh, TLR4 and 2 are observed uh, in higher activity in patients with anterior uveitis. So what about anterior uveitis, or HLA-B27? And HLA-B27, at least when we see it, actually has a very um, classic appearance that you don't see anywhere else. And what these two pictures de depict is what we call a hypopion and a fibrinoid reaction. And what's nice is that when I look in the eye, I already know that they're HLA-B27 positive. So it's not even that I'm guessing on the blood test. This is just such a remarkable finding that it makes it super, super easy to diagnose. Now, um, the thing about a hypopion is that it can be seen in other conditions. And what's a hypopion is when the white cells are so great in the front of the eye that it deposits and it makes this layer of white cells or pus uh, flattening out due to gravity. Uh, so um, when we look in the front of the eye, what we actually see with the slit lamp is the amount of cells that are in the anterior chamber. And we can count the number of cells per high power field and grade the flare. So when we do research studies, that's kind of what we're grading and grading the response. But when it's so great, you get this hypopion that layers out. Now, what are the other... Um, diseases that can cause a hypopion. It's actually pretty limited. Endophthalmitis, uh, which is an infection in the eye, uh, endophthalmitis can be endogenous or exogenous. So the history is pretty easy. You get trauma to the eye, cataract surgery uh, that was complex, and they get an infection, you see a hypopion. Uh, IV drug user, someone who's in the hospital with a line, they get a hypopion. You think about uh, endogenous endophthalmitis. Uh, Bichette's is one of the classic ones that can cause an endophthalmite or a hypopion, but what's really unique about a hypopion and Bichette's is that it doesn't seem to be fibrinoid or sticky. You can actually turn the person's head for about five minutes or even just a couple, and the hypopion will shift and move uh, to the dependent position. So it makes it really easy to diagnose. And then it's just HLAB27. So again, it's one of those findings that when I see a hypopion, I already know they're HLAB27. What's a fibrinoid reaction? They just get this platelet response where it's just really fibrinoid. It looks like, uh, almost like um, spider webs that we see in the front of the eye. So when we see that, again, it's one of those ones that we really typically know that this is going to be HLA-B27. So what about HLA-B27? So what I try to teach the residents is I already know that it's HLA-B27 without getting a blood test. What I'm more curious about is if they have associated systemic disease. And when you look at all causes of uh, spinal arthropathies associated with HLA-B27, like you probably know, the majority of those that we see are associated with ankylosing spondylitis. In case series, they're seen in about 25 to 35% of these cases. Uh, reactive arthritis, a lot less common, 
uh, but second most common, 2 to 13 percent. The common triad we associate with is conjunctivitis, but uh, those tend to be pretty self-limiting and not harmful to the vision. Uh, but inside the eye, the iritis may be 2 to 13 percent. Uh, the classic teaching is for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, you have to have the uh, arthritis to have the eye disease, but like you can see, uh, just having psoriasis may be a few, 1 to 2 percent, but pretty uncommon. Uh, the last two, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, super uncommon. I know that's saying 5 to 10 percent in Crohn's. I actually have really never made a diagnosis of Crohn's uh, so far, so it seems to be pretty uncommon. Now, the one caveat I will say about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is you can get posterior segment disease. So when you talk about anterior uveitis in the front, those two can also affect the back of the eye, but again, it tends to be a lot less common. Now, what about us? Why do we ask you, except to annoy you, and ask for blood work and stuff like that? So what our um, importance is, we really want to know uh, where the location is to help you guide in treatment and help you in managing our patients. Now, like you probably know, you don't always get referrals from ophthalmologists. You also get them from optometrists. Um, we sound close to the same. Uh, they're not med school trained. I have a lot of respect for them, but um, when I even get referrals, their pathologic dispo uh, exposure to pathologic disease is a lot less. So sometimes uh, they can make mistakes. Just really make sure uh, uh, the history uh, is there and that it's anterior uveitis. And what I mean by that is when you get an inflammation in the eye, uh, inflammation in the back of the eye um, actually doesn't hurt. Uh, there's no pain fibers in the back of the eye. So when you get a posterior pan uveitis, you get a painless loss of vision. The only pain fibers on the inside of the eye is actually in the iris and ciliary bodies. So when you get an iritis, the eye turns red, it looks like a pink eye, and they get a loss of vision. So the history really helps. Now, when we ask you, you know, uh, to find an underlying cause, this drives me uh, crazy. For HLAB27 disease, it's really important, but like you know, sometimes we don't have a quote-unquote underlying cause. We're just not smart enough to uh, know all the causes of autoimmune conditions of the eye. Um, now, um, when you find the underlying condition, at least for HLAB27, you'll get two different approaches. Um, at least for my colleagues, um, what they want to know is if there's any systemic cause of the uh, condition. And that one involves this workup that I was telling you. And when you talk about pure anterior uveitis, you can see the workup is pretty small. Uh, B27, like I said, if you like going to Vegas, B27 is the highest association. Don't forget about sarcoidosis. I, don't, I know that a lot of times when I see uh, a referral from you guys, um, uh, ACE or IL-2 or chest X-ray uh, is never done. Remember, sarcoidosis is a pretty significant cause of uveitis in the eye, both anterior, posterior, and pan. Now, don't forget about syphilis. It's the great masquerader. It can look like anything in the eye. Um, I've had uh, a couple unfortunate incidents where I had a pasture who had uh, syphilis uh, uveitis, and the wife asked me how they got that, and I told them I wasn't smart enough to uh, see the infectious disease doctor. So uh, don't forget that. Um, now, viral causes for the eye are actually uh, maybe the most common cause. When we look at a lot of the uh, causes of idiopathic anterior uveitis, when we could do a PCR of an anterior chamber tap, uh, we actually found a lot of uh, cases that we considered idiopathic were actually herpetic. Um, rubella can kind of do it, but most are herpetic. But it didn't seem to change the course. When we gave antivirals, we couldn't really eradicate disease. So there's really no practical test for virals. So again, when we ask you and ask for help for these patients, when someone sends an eye patient to you, the differential di diagnosis of a pure anterior uveitis is really small in regards to the laboratory workup. There's really simple uh, blood tests that you have to do, and that's really it. I don't test for Sjogren's. Like you see, I didn't throw an ANA in there. I didn't throw an ANCA. Those things don't cause a pure anterior uveitis. Now, again, when you look at these causes, why it's important, um, anterior uveitis comprises this large majority with 50% of those. So again, the workup is super important to look for those uh, diseases. What do I want from you? So if it's coming from me, it's a little different. Like I said, I already know that they're HLAB27 positive. I know 
that I already checked for sarcoid, syphilis, and infectious etiologies. So what I'm looking for is if there's any systemic diseases. And what you have to remember is the eye disease can precede systemic diseases by about 70% of the time. So even though you don't find anything now, what I'm asking you is just keep them in mind in case they develop something later in life. Uh, so again, think about that when someone who's not UVI's trained sends someone to you. We're just not asking you that you can help them find something that's causing, just to remind the patient that even though we don't find something now, if you're HLA-B27 positive, uh, throughout your life you can develop one of the diseases. Now, what about treatment? So when we throw someone at you, you know, we get you, we ask you, hey, help us treat these patients. And when you look at the eye, it's a little unique because I tell people we treat it kind of like a teeter-totter. On one side of the teeter-totter, we have local therapy, and the other side of the teeter-totter, we have systemic therapy. And what helps us decide which therapy uh, to do is you think about what the disease can cause in, in regards to complications. And if you look at the front of the eye disease, the problems that anterior uveitis or iris can cause is cataracts and glaucoma. Now, very rarely it can cause cystoid macular edema. Now, cystoid macular edema is swelling of the macula or the center of vision where we see best. Why we get um, inflammation in the front that causes swelling in the back, we don't know. The blood vessels seem to be more susceptible. Even if you look at the most perfect cataract surgery, we know on fluorescein angiogram, which is a dye study to look at leakage, people almost 100% have leakage in the macula that uh, will go away most of the time, but sometimes it needs to be treated. But most of the time, antiuveitis doesn't always lead to cystoid macular edema. Why do we worry about that? It's neuro tissue. Recurrent bouts of cystoid macular edema can cause permanent damage to the vision. So if they keep getting bouts, all of a sudden uh, their vision drops to 2040. They get another bout, they're dropped to 2060, they get another one, they're at 2070, and they're almost not legal to drive anymore. It's a big change in quality of life. So what we try to do is balance this uh, teeter-totter in regards to treatment. Does anybody know the side effects of local treatment, which typically involves topical steroids? It's actually the same. Steroids drops to the eyes can cause cataracts and glaucoma. So everybody says, well, wait, if my treatment is worse than the disease, why am I giving you this treatment? Well, it's a balance. If they're flaring up uh, once a year and you're only using drops once a year, the chance of ca developing cataracts and glaucoma from steroid drops is pretty low. But if they're flaring up weekly or monthly, uh, the chance of developing cataracts and glaucoma go up higher, then uh, your treatment kind of tilts the other side of the teeter-totter more for systemic therapy. Now, these are our current um, topical or um, periocular treatments that we have. Predforte or prednisolone acetate is our bread and butter steroid. Um, it's been around for a long time. You have to remember to tell patients to shake it up. Otherwise, the medicine sits on the bottom. So I've had patients refer to me where they weren't responsive to the treatment, and I asked them if they were shaking the bottle, and sure enough, they weren't, and they're back to treatment. Now, Durazol is my new favorite drug. Unfortunately, there's no generic, but it's almost four to six times more potent than Predforte, and it has a really unique ability to actually, for some reason, penetrate into the back of the eye. You have to remember our topical therapies are actually kind of hard to do. There's... Uh, when you develop a topical drug, you have to pass the liquid barrier first, so it's got to be hydrophilic, but then it has to pass the cornea, so it has to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic to pass the lipid barrier, and then back to being uh, penetrated into the uh, aqueous, which is liquid, uh, to get into the eye. Um, so Durazol, for some reason, gets way into the back of the eye, even into the macula. Um, uh, I remember I gave a talk down in Houston, and uh, a pretty famous retina doc, I told him I didn't give shots next to the eye anymore because Durazol worked, and he was like, what? I've never heard that. And I was like, a lot of us UVI guys noticed it right away. And um, sure enough, someone did a study where they radio-labeled the drug, and they were able to prove that it does penetrate into the back of the eye. Uh, Kenalog, like you know, Triamcillin off the shelf. Um, we use it either into or next to the eye. So we can put it next to the eye. Patients love it when I come after them with a needle. Um, um, but there's problems with this. Is, uh, it's a formulation that has a little alcohol in it. And when we do it in the eye, we have some people who get a sterile reaction to it. So they develop a medicine called Tracens. It's the same thing. It's just safer to 
uh, placed in the eye because they removed the preservatives. Now, again, the problem with those uh, drugs is they can cause cataracts and glaucoma. So I tell people the closer that you move the drug into the eye, the higher chance of developing cataracts and glaucoma. We have a three-year drug that I can sew in the eye. It's called Redisert. It lasts for three years, costs $18,000 to sew in, but it has a 100% cataract rate and either a 30 to 50% glaucoma rate. So if you look at this, what makes you decide which treatment to use? If you look at all HLA-B27 or all iritis patients, 90% of them keep 2040 vision or better, regardless of what we do. So in general, it really has a good prognosis. So again, when you're weighing someone to put on Humira or a systemic, and then you're like, man, most of the time you keep vision, this should be a simple bread and butter kind of treatment because most keep good vision. So when you look at the treatment and someone refers to you, uh, these patients with iritis, topical therapy tends to be the mainstay of treatment. Now, HLA-B27 is different. It tends to relapse, it tends to alternate from one eye to the other, and it tends to be the more aggressive. So the HLA-B27s are the ones that you kind of put the little asterisk by, that this one is the one that you might need systemic therapy. Now, got a poll question. We're kind of coming to the end. Uh, this is the easiest case for you. Let's say we have a 24-year-old male who's got HLA-B27 uveitis, um, and he's got lower back arthritis, and this gets sent to you. So the poll questions are, or the answers are, um, let's see. So the rheumatologist would, let's see where the answers are. Okay. Answers are in. It looks like the oh. first choice <laughs> leading the way A, start patient on systemic meds, and then C, look for other causes of eye inflammation. So um, I wish I actually had the. So the it's going to show in a second there. Oh, okay. There you go. So um, I like answer D. Thank you very much. So, uh, <laughs> so the problem is that, um, so for this one, I think uh, answer A is the best one. So I already know that uh, they're HLA-B27 positive. They have the low back. Uh, you can look, but you know that most of the time you're already kind of uh, where it is. And if they have lower back arthritis, I guess if you're looking for that systemic disease, uh, that certainly can be the, question, or the answer. But you already know that you're going to treat uh, the arthritis. And what happens is when you treat their uh, lower back arthritis, the eye comes along with it. So most of the time... Uh, again, this is a pretty mild disease. What you do to treat systemically uh, helps the eye in general. So that's actually a super easy one to treat. Now, let's say the second easiest one. This is our next poll question. Uh, you get a HLA-B27 positive person, uh, no spinal arthropathies, no cataracts or glaucoma, but they flare just once a year, and the um, eye care professional sends the patient to you and says, uh, what do you, I want you to see them and do something. So what's the, the answer for this one, or how would you treat them? And funny enough, the answers are kind of the same. Well, yeah, D is not moving up. <laughs> but, Darn it. <laughs> but the leading answer right now is B, start topical eye drops only. And then a split between A and C, start yeah. on systemic meds or look for other causes of eye inflammation. So this one, I... You're absolutely right. So uh, a lot of times when I tell my colleagues when they're referring to you is that not all patients need uh, systemic therapy. This carries a good prognosis, 2040 vision. Um, and uh, Janet Thorne, she's a pretty famous UVI person at uh, Johns Hopkins, actually had two pretty landmark papers uh, these last couple years. And she showed that if you use topical Predforte, that's that bread and butter treatment, at three times a day or less continuously for two years, the chance of causing cataracts and glaucoma was actually zero. So in some of these patients, the lesser evil versus starting a systemic therapy is actually using topical uh, therapy. So uh, there's nothing wrong referring the patient back to us and saying, hey, why don't you just try chronic topical therapy? Now, we're trained that that's a no-no, but when you're like, well, the risk of putting someone on Humira even low and we monitor, pretty small compared to getting cataracts and glaucoma. 
uh, just really quick, cataracts you probably know are just haziness of the lens, and glaucoma can be permanent. That's where the pressure damages the optic nerve and you lose peripheral vision and it can work its way in. We can't get the loss back, so that one, um, it's a little more concerning, but most of the time if we catch it easy or early, it's easy to treat. Now, let's say you would get into some other cases, and this is the three times a day or less where uh, the chance of cataracts and glaucoma was zero. Now, the tough ones. Let's say you get this 24-year-old male. He's got no spinal properties. One of the eyes requires three different eye drops to control the pressure. He also has a history of cystic macular edema, and he keeps flaring. Well, this one gets a little tougher. This one, if we use topical drops, we already know that he has glaucoma. They have little wiggle room. They don't have any spinal arthropathies, but this is the one that I might send to you and say, hey, you know, this one I might need a systemic uh, treatment. Now, um, again, this is kind of what we were talking about. Now, my last poll question um, here. Oh, I, had, I think I had one. Oop, did I skip it? They're already, they've actually already answered it. Okay. Uh, that uh, 90 percent well, have said they would start a systemic med. Perfect. Eight percent would look for uh, other causes. Yes. So that was a perfect one. Now, uh, when you go back to um, treatment, um, one of the other things that you can recommend to the eye care professional who refers people to you is that we can actually use topical nonsteroidals, kind of like you use systemic nonsteroidals. If they uh, get flares, but they're frequent, but not too bad. Sometimes the topical nonsteroidals aren't strong enough to break a flare, but they're enough to keep them from having one. And what's nice about topical nonsteroidals is they can't cause cataracts and glaucoma, so it's the lesser evil. So some patients who used to flare uh, every two months, I have them on chronic topical um, ketorolac twice a day, and all of a sudden they flare once a year, and that's kind of the lesser uh, evil. Now. Uh, now, if they flare past topicals, and this is kind of what I was saying, this is where, unfortunately, we have to annoy you and we're asking for uh, systemic treatment. Now, last tough one. Let's say you get a 74-year-old lady with a new onset of iritis. You know 50% of the time it's going to be HLA-B27, right? No, that doesn't make sense because HLA-B27 doesn't quite fit this disease. You see her walking in like this, uh, bent over. Do you know what the cause of this one is? besides reading down below. Yeah, don't forget about bisphosphonates. For some reason, Fosmax, Actinil, even the IV, we see some uh, patients with severe posterior disease uh, can cause inflammation in the eyes. So if you get a patient who has quote unquote iritis referred uh, from uh, an eye care professional and you're like, this doesn't make sense, the lab work was normal, uh, try to look for a drug-induced causes of iritis. Now my last slide, um, I'll try to get, um, or two last slides, is again, understand uh, the importance of HLA-B27 iritis like we talked about, it comprises 50% of diseases. Interpret your role, uh, not only the blood work, which is pretty simple, but uh, number two, three, how you're gonna approach the treatment. It's very valid to say, hey, the systemics uh, for this mild disease might be too big of a hammer, uh, topical might be better, or we might say, hey, this person has cataracts, glaucoma, and cystoid macular edema that we need uh, systemic treatment. Now, my last slide is this is kind of what I do on the weekend, so I'm asking you uh, not to annoy me. I'm just kidding. I love what I do. Uh, if you look at all retina and uh, or UVI specialists across the country, there's actually only 250 of us uh, crazy enough to go into this field. Uh, my partners, Dr. Callahan, and my new partner, Dr. Choi, are one of the other um, retina uveitis specialist. Retina uveitis to do the back of the eye disease and uveitis, there's only about 50 of us. But luckily in the Metroplex, we have other uveitis specialists, uh, Tina Chen over in this Tarrant County side and Jennifer uh, Sal, who used to be at the university, but now she's at private practice in Irving are also uveitis trained. So at least in the Metroplex, uh, you guys have a, a good group that if you need to call on us uh, for some complex diseases or just answers for you get a referral, um, uh, please don't hesitate to call. Thanks a lot.